and let's turn our attention to what happened earlier today. The police seem to have made some inroads in finding out the killers of a former political advisor to former President Gulag, Jonathan Mr. Hamed Gulag, who was murdered uh, by a group of armed men on the 30th of May 2021 during a visit to Emote State. He was reportedly trained from his hotel room to the spot where he was killed around Umweze, Umbiangu, in Ingokbala, local government area close to the Sam Umbakwe Airport Road in Nowere. What was interesting about this is the confession statement made by the, uh, the alleged killer that politicians visit, top politicians visit them in the bush. Let's get uh, a feel of what this uh, means, especially for the security in the southeastern region of the country. And perhaps one year later, uh, finding out uh, the face of those who have killed. I'm being joined by Mr. Uh, Kabir Adamu. Thank you so much, Mr. Adamu, for joining us. My pleasure, Hugh. First and foremost, a year after, a Megula's killer, alleged killer, being paraded by the police. What are your initial thoughts on this? Quite interesting. Um, first of the period it took, and then the fact that um, an individual has been identified as a likely suspect. Um, it speaks to the fact that at least the police has, that, that case is not a cold case. Uh, they are still looking into it. Um, in what manner was the conf confession obtained? Would that confession stand the test of a competent court of jurisdiction? Um, so those are the kind of things that came to my mind. Um, media reports of the confession by the suspect uh, indicates a difference between what the police was mentioned during the media statement and what the suspect may have mentioned. So again, these are things that will probably come up during the prosecution if, if it reaches that case. All right. Let's take a moment now. Let's let you know that the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, any moment from now will work, is already in uh, the banquet hall of the, uh, the presidential villa where the Bank of Industry 5th edition of the National MSME Awards 2022 is taking place. We're live here for you at that moment. Of course, the program continues right on the stream of channels television. Stay with us right here. Let's continue our conversation now with uh, Mr. Kabura Damu. So now, the thing is, the confession has still been being made. Yep. And uh, those are the fact that, look, some politicians who are allegedly sponsoring these elements come into the bush to give them items, money, and give them instructions. What implication does that have for, um, for the security in Southeast? So there is no part of the country where the issue of the politicization of um, insecurity has not emerged. In fact, uh, we had a time last year where the president, during a speech, alluded to the fact that um, security has been politicized. Now, in terms of implication, we are going into the 2023 elections. Um, those that allegedly were sp are sponsoring these non-state actors, what is their objective? Are they doing it to provide security for their own objective, or are they doing it to destabilize the current um, political arrangement within the state in order, in order to use it for their campaign, or are they doing it in order to show people that this particular government is not able to function. So whatever the case is, what, if we pick the last um, scenario I gave, they're going to use it for um, you know, the electioneering. In other words, uh, this current administration has not been able to provide security. We would provide security. So there are several implications depending on what angle we look at it. What I think is paramount is the fact that they, were able, they are able to do it without any consequences. It, prove, it leads to an environment where more people would go into that. Um, funding insecurity in order to use it as a weapon to achieve political objectives. And that's dangerous for any country. Because uh, the reason why this is very fundamental, the issue of uh, uh, the, the sponsors and the collaborators of this uh, element is the fact that we've heard many times over that politicians are using this element to destabilize the region. Now, how difficult is it to name and shame these, ele these guys that are sponsoring them? The same we hear about Boko Haram. Boko Haram are sponsored by some element, I mean, highly placed elements in the society. How difficult is it to trail and capture the identities of sponsors if they are actually politically exposed persons? Um, it's, uh, the, the answer to that is the intelligence. Um, if the intelligence apparatus of the state 
is working effectively and efficiently, it should be able to identify uh, these individuals. And not only identify them, gather compelling evidence and present that compelling evidence to the political actors so that the, pol the political actors would issue the necessary directive. And I think that is where the issue is. Even where the intelligence actors are able to gather this evidence, sometimes uh, the possibility that perhaps for political correctness, the politicians would not act on that intelligence. But um, as far as I know, the intelligence community within Nigeria gathers those type of um, you know, information and makes it available to the political class. Now, would it be in the interest of the political class to act on that intelligence? Those are areas that unfortunately is not in, within the remit of a public discussion. But bottom line, the answer to your question is an intelligence, effective intelligence. I mean, we've heard a few times that the, there are confessional statements. Uh, is it that you cannot use a confessional statement to announce what these suspects have said in a criminal uh, uh, a proceeding? Or is it that uh, the police naturally are waiting uh, for a judgment delivered in the court before they can make uh, those, uh, those calls? Uh, that, that, I think, is a question that should be answered by a lawyer. But from a security point of view, there are certain things. How was the evidence ob obtained? What um, other evidences have been gathered to corroborate that confession by the suspect? Um, those are things that you know should, would be uh, presented in a competent court of jurisdiction. But um, what, in, in from a security point of view, beyond the confession, what other evidence is there? Because the, 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 the big question here, Mr. Adam, is you are one person that does a lot of research. You put in us to the ground to find out exactly what is happening, and sniffing all of this information, trying to wrap one's head around what exactly is going on, is in the heart of the fact that. Um, the, the federal government has said it repeatedly that they have a list of, um, uh, of terror funders in the country. And so Nigerians have said, bring this list, name these people. Again, we are hearing that in the Southeast region, where a lot of people think that, look, what is happening there is on call for beheading of human beings, killing, uh, gruesome murder of people and uh, very, uh, uh, I mean, uh, unprintable things that happen in that region of the country. And when these are linked to uh, pressings, I mean, that's the reason why one would be wondering why, why is it difficult for intelligence uh, to be able to give us a clue to these people so that at the end of the day, they can be named and shamed and stopped. Um, in my honest opinion, I do not think it's difficult for intelligence to provide that kind of information. It's very likely that that information has already been provided. But perhaps the question is, why is that information not being acted upon? Um, a sitting governor from the Southeast uh, has repeatedly mentioned that what is happening there is political. And perhaps what happened today is a corroboration on the 20th of, of June, because we are told that that's when the suspect was arrested, is a corroboration of that statement by that governor. Now, um, the next point, perhaps that we can discuss, is why is the Nigerian state finding it difficult to prosecute offend offenders? But I think that, that is the, the whole issue. Is there a criminal I mean, process or what? Because the Administration of Criminal, criminal. Justice Act has really helped. And in fact, you can have a, 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 a PCR uh, administration of justice in this country I mean, as soon as that happened from 2015 upward. I mean, that was supposed to be a milestone in achieving uh, justice in criminal proceeding, but then we have all of this is terror and uh, uh, te te terror uh, uh, prosecution different totally from general prosecu prosecution of cri uh, criminal in cri under criminal law. As far as I know, um, if if we look at the different components of the criminal justice system, none of them is working effectively. Um, if let's pick law enforcement as a single unit of um, you know the criminal justice system, uh, how many how, how many times uh, you are a journalist and I'm sure you visited uh, law enforcement departments? How many of them have um, um, storage uh, facilities for or evidence evidence rooms for gathering and keeping those evidence evidences? How many of them obtain 
even this confession that, we, that we're discussing at the moment in a manner that can be um, you know, pre presented in a competent court of jurisdiction. So I, I think, yes, there is a difference, of course, between um, the prosecution of a criminal case as well as a, a, um, a terror case. The Terror the Prison Prevention Act would determine uh, whether it's a terror, terrorism act or not. But irrespective of what it is, the gathering of evidence to support your case, as the, in this instance, law enforcement agencies, I think is at the bottom of, the, of this matter. Um, the case of Gulak in question, um, unfortunately, I think it's not wise to, to go further because, of course, the case is likely still in court. Um, what the, 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 the I'm not sure he's in court yet. <laughs> well, I, I hope. I hope, yeah, yeah. I, hope I mean, they've not. I'm not sure they've charged those uh, those guys. Those individuals. They were just paraded today, so I'm not sure they've charged them. Uh, so, as, as far uh, as I'm concerned, previously there was an arrest of certain persons, persons. that were that were linked to that that case. And the question, what I was trying to bring up is the vehicle that was driven um, for, and that was used for that purpose, the gun that was used in shooting um, the deceased, the uh, you know, um, bullet, bullet shells from that gun, all of that had they been gathered? Are they in an evidence room waiting for perhaps a time when it to be presented in court? So those are the issues that we need to discuss. How are these processes? In fact, do we even have a standard operating procedure for guiding the law enforcement agencies when it comes to matters and even like the this. protection of crime scenes. Uh, uh, exactly, um, we can in cite... our you can see what happened. I mean, exactly. you, when we wonder that in a, in a stand, I mean, in other crimes, a standard crime scene would have been shielded away from having highly protected twenty four hours of the day, exactly. so that you can extract. But the question that a lot of people will ask you, even when you protect those yeah, evidence yes. and the environment, <laughs> you have to do forensics on them. Exactly. Do we have what it takes? Because as far as I know, it's only one forensic lab that we have in this country, and it's in Lagos. The last um, time during the NSAS uh, uh, situation in Lagos, I understand that it was, uh, vandalized, it was, it yeah. was uh, vandalized. So the um, question is that to obtain this evidence and do a forensics on them, uh, do we even have the capacity? In my experience, I think we have the capacity. Here in Abuja, I've had instances where I've invited the police to... Um, cases that I'm managing. As you know, I, I run a consultancy and um, they've, they've proven quite effective. In is there a forensic, forensic lab here in Abuja? As far as I know, yes. Private, not government. Uh, no, government. government. In Abuja? As far as I know. What, what the condition of that forensic lab is, I don't know. But like I said, I've invited the police to cases and I've seen them conducting forensic investigations. So because what you do in a forensic evaluation or investigation is to compare um, identities of criminals or participants in a, in a criminal environment and use their uh, biometrics and their data to, uh, to, as against tie, tie, the, tie, evidence tie, tie and, and, the evidence and match it. So the question is, do we even have data? So, the, so, so that is the beginning point. Yeah. How the integrity of the data that we have. We do have data. Mm -hmm. but what is the integrity of that data? Yeah. How, how, how much of the population has the, of the population of this Suspects, quote and unquote, because of course it's not every individual has it been has has been captured. Um, these are issues and questions that I think would help uh, our criminal justice system, and perhaps therein lies the answer to the inability to prosecute ind individuals. But separate from your initial question, the naming and perhaps even helping Nigerians understand who these individuals are, because. If we're, if we're going to get the buy-in of Nigerians in supporting, especially our counterterrorism um, strategy, Nigerians need to understand who these, these individuals are. If there is compelling evidence, for instance, that someone has supported, in this instance, non-state actors who are doing the dastardly things that we've talked about in um, the Southeast and several other parts of the country, I think by now those persons should be revealed to Nigerians so that every Nigerian can say and support the, 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 the system to say, okay, that individual was seen in a particular part of the country. That this is what, he, it makes it difficult for that individual to operate. It makes it difficult for that individual to get the kind of support they're currently getting at the moment. But if Nigerians are left in the dark like we currently are, and unfortunately supporting the counterterrorism strategy becomes difficult. In prosecuting criminal offenses in this country, uh, the, the bad leg or the Achilles of, of that process it's investigation, and, uh, uh, and it's also stemmed from lack of credible data uh, to be able to, to, to pursue uh, that uh, investigation or prosecution. Now, uh, you see what the governor of uh, Ondo State did. He immediately asked all public and private institutions to 
to install CCTV cameras. Now, we've seen how this is being used in prosecution in, uh, in, in, in other climes, in the UK, in, the, in France, in uh, even the US and Germany, and the, in the UAE. In fact, a UAE sometimes, you are almost not aware in the, in the Dubai airport, for example, you are, the cameras are so, so much that they captured you. In fact, if they notice anything within the first one hour, anything you see, they will swoop on you. And you may not, on, you, you, you would probably not know that they're monitoring you. Now, the question is, how do we get to that level? Because we need to, because it will have been easier if there are street cameras that have captured these guys and trailed where they went because it takes a long time to be able to track them four hours, three hours after these criminal elements have left town on motorbikes. We're still looking for, for them. So if you had all of these gadgets monitoring and uh, real time you're able to follow them, it's probably be easy. Where do we start from? Um, our surveillance capabilities um, as a country would need, need, need to be enhanced. And surveillance has different components. Um, time will not allow us to go into the whole details. Um, when, when you speak of surveillance, it's just one aspect of a security layer. In my honest opinion of you know, um, researching security in Nigeria, studying it, uh, we don't deploy security in the layers that is usually advised. So as an example, if an executive governor says um, CCTV should be installed, we're talking of just one layer of security. The moment that layer is breached, what happens? You reach the target. Mm -hmm. But if you want an effective security, you have to deploy at least in those three layers or four layers. Um, the layer to detect, which perhaps um, the surveillance capabilities can do. So you have a database. Um, the, the picture of an individual is seen. Right? It's matched with that database. And the name and the background of that individual pops up. He's a terrorist. He's a non-state actor. He's whatever, whatever. And then the law enforcement agencies would go after him. The second component would be to deny. So you, the, the person has been seen. Let, let, let me use your premises as an example. Mm. You do have a gate. You have security guards. They are able to deny a, an average criminal from coming in because, I mean, they are, they are protected, of course. And then, of course, the, the last one is to delay that, that possibility. Imagine the several layers of protection before they reach us in the, in the studio there. So that, that's an, a simple and example. And the response time also. That's the last one. The response time. So every good security arrangement will have to have at least these four layers of security. The reason why I brought this up to you is even if you have good surveillance capabilities, which by the way we don't have, then we also need to talk about the three other aspects of security. Um, the Ministry of Digital Economy um, and its arm, NCC, can play a critical role in this regard. Um, a lot is happening in the digital space, a lot. You reference the fact that I have a consultancy. We use what we call open source intelligence. It's called OSINT. The quantity of intelligence that you can get from OSINT is, is so much. And if we use that ministry, deploy the capabilities of that ministry effectively, there's so much that we can is do. Is our satellite work. still working? That has another surveillance capabilities. Um, as far as I know, no, it's not, it's not working. Because if it were working, the scenario There was a time that they said it was even lost in orbit. Um, well, um, I, I think it has a tenure, and that tenure probably would have ended. I, there was a time... Said I, by China. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, and we have to pay them for their services, whatever. I they think are. it was the initial 10 years or thereabout. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, that, that's a major problem. All because, of, all I mean, uh, America remotely monitored uh, and uh, executed an operation by his, uh, um, uh, his, 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 a team um, of a specialized force that evacuated one of his citizens on the shores, and I mean, on the territory of Nigeria that was kidnapped, I think, in the Nigeria, Chad Republic. Um, showing, showing what you saw yeah. is the end result of an intelligence-led op op operation. operation. That's, all, that's what we saw. Now, before that particular um, um, Evacuation. extraction, extraction, an extraction yeah. Yeah. before that, that particular extraction, the quantity of intelligence that was gathered is one that perhaps if we start to talk about it, it will give us an indication of the value of intelligence in any operation. Because, I mean, what, I mean security experts would describe in vivid terms that American satellites will pick as much as the color Apart of the dress. Apart from satellite, you would have human intelligence. Yes. I'm, the, I am almost yes. certain whatever they pick up from these satellites or surveillance capabilities that they have, it will be corroborated by human 
intelligence somewhere. Before might, they deploy. Before they deploy. And they would also weigh the consequences. Because remember, by acting in the, in the manner they act, they would have destroyed a, a very critical source for them in that region. So it's the value of that, um, that life, that American, as an example, what th that source that they would have you know, destroyed, quote and unquote, by that, by that action. So there are several layers that we need to put in place to get, to get it right. Um, it, this is it's not in my place to denigrate the action of any individual, perhaps because he has recommended one thing, but we have to look at the whole picture. And I, I would always insist getting our people involved, getting their buy-in, supporting our security operations is the way to go. Right. I, I probably would, would like us to anchor on this note because I was speaking with someone and he said, me looking at a television picture of a crime scene in Nigeria either puts our security agencies as a laughing stock in the Committee of Nations. Simple. Um, the case of um, Ed, Ed Evans is, is an example of that. They were hugging him. They were holding his um, phones, taking pictures with them in the process, destroying evidence. Where are we today? How many years down the road has he been prosecuted? Because America is a home of plea bargain. Because I mean, and I always tell people, if you show a criminal an evidence, evidence too vivid, he will plea a bargain. Simple. Because he will tell you that with all this evidence, there is nowhere to run to. And, and, and in the process, you would have saved taxpayers' money. Yes, and, and, so and the time and the year. And get, even gathered more, more evidence. Yeah, and we'd even tell you his collaborators, and you, that will help you. Uh, so, so even the case that we're discussing, if that had been done, yeah. as an example, perhaps we'd have gotten a bigger picture and mm -hmm. arrested bigger fish. Yeah. Even. And I hope that, uh, I mean, the evidence they're gathering, uh, they are able to sweep on, because as much as they've arrested these guys, don't... Don't think that those uh, these collaborators she, are still in the she, bush. They probably is, changed location. Is too, it's too late. They put, they put it out in the media. <laughs> they put, <laughs> every, everybody in the world is aware. One well, so, thing that we're proud They're not going to wait. <laughs> absolutely. Is that Imo State, Southeast Nigeria, and Nigeria at large is safe. Hopefully. That's the essence. Hopefully. Thank you so much, Mr. Cabral. My, my pleasure. Always very insightful to talk to you. Thank Same you so here. much. Appreciate it.